So, Rob, I thought today we would start with um, a little background on Epic, right? So many people uh, subscribing to the channel now and, and watching these videos. And a lot of people are asking, so why, why Epic? What does that mean? And, and how did you come up with Epic Financial Strategies? What, what made you get into it? So let's start with that. Yeah, listen, thanks for that. Awesome access. And I think if uh, when we look at the name Epic, E-P-I-C, we want to give... Um, Kelly Cole, who is somebody that's been a part of this world here for the last, I don't know, 15, 16 years, she actually was able to integrate what we do, which is empower, protect, integrate, and coordinate when it comes to your money. And she actually came up with the name, interestingly enough. Yeah. Uh, so major shout out, shout out, major shout out to Kelly Cole on that. Um, but yeah, that's that's where it started. But we were already in business. Um, prior to that as a DBA called Gill Financial Group. Wow. So let's take them back to even before that, right? So financial services, when did you get into the financial services industry? So for me, um, back in 1996, a friend of mine um, asked me if I wanted a job on Wall Street. And uh, he was making like 200 $250 a week, cold calling. And this was before having a Series 7. What he would do is... Um, uh, get leads for, for senior brokers so they could call people up and open new accounts over the telephone, a very common thing back then. So I didn't have a job, and um, from I didn't graduate college. Mm. I felt like I was myself looking for uh, economic redemption and wanted to be able to have a career. So I burnt all the boats, and I decided to go take a commute every day from Bayonne, New Jersey. Okay to Manhattan, to Wall Street, an hour and 20 minutes each, each, each way. I was getting up at like 5.45 in the morning. And I literally worked on the phones from 8 till 6 or 7 p.m. every day wow. for about four years. Was there something, so in that you were calling, yeah. getting you know, uh, senior brokers, leads, and that sort of stuff. When did you start to make the transition? Did you start to become a senior broker at some point? Yeah, so for me, um, you know, I for a whole year, um, I was studying for my Series 7 while getting leads for other folks. And, um, you know, when you're making 400 dials a day, 300 dials a day. Wow. Um, but there was no other choices. Like, that, right. that was the beautiful thing. Like, I had no, I, I made a decision. You know, you talk about what is the definition of decision or the Latin root. It's the mm. cutoff. So for me, um, July 1996, I, I stopped drinking, haven't had a drink since. And my whole life was the telephone, home, sleep, workout, come back, telephone. <laughs> that was it. And I was 26, 27, 28 years old. And what happened in that environment, Ed, is uh, when you're in a room full of people, there's a different energy, yeah. right? Yeah. And even to this day, when it comes to sitting down and, and speaking with clients, partners, business associates, the person that brings the most certainty and energy with integrity, of course, is the person that really begins to lead by action. And I learned that inherently at that time. I didn't have a definition. There was no language, which we've later found out and I'm blinded. Right. There was no language for that, but I was able to figure out that if I stayed in that system and if I came in and worked hard every day, no matter what I was going through emotionally, mm. I would have like a, a, a compliance approved presentation so even if I was kind of like, you know, let's say a little sad or let's say if I was a little angry, if I stayed on that presentation and removed my emotion, I realized that pretty fast. And the folks that didn't know how to do that were the folks that got stuck and couldn't advance. And I didn't have a language for that. So, so, so you know. that was like your roadmap to it was how to how to be successful in the moment, how to be a peak performance specific to opening new accounts over yeah, the phone. That's yeah. amazing. And. When did you decide or when was it that you made that transition out of just, let's call it the stockbroker world into more financial yeah. services, which which includes, you know, the, the idea of financial planning and insurances and all these different things that, that are involved? Yeah. So so um, thank you for that for that question. And for anyone out there, listen, if you know someone or they achieved overnight success, that is awesome. Um, I can't explain to you what overnight success looks like. I'm not the guy to talk to. Uh, what I can tell you is it was a journey of discovery and it was born in continuous and relentless failures, mm. right? And the more I failed with an open mind, the more that resistance uplifted me. 
It's a very strange thing. So, um, you know, from 96, 97, 98, I was opening accounts because I had passed my Series 7 at that point for a senior broker. And, you know, what I realized like 99, 2000, 2001, as I began to do it on my own, when it comes to stocks, we have no, con we could believe in it. We could love it. Right. But if I'm calling somebody up on the phone to buy a stock and the stock goes higher, right? I'm not a fiduciary and I no longer have my Series 7 for purposes of this podcast and the business that we do right. in our social media. But when it comes to stocks, we have no control if it goes up or down. Right. And that became a disempowering feeling. Um, because once again, and you may have heard about this from time to time, there's called a, a behavioral finance. Yes. Which is non logical. And you see it in internet stocks, you see it in crypto stocks, you see it in uh, these shorts that were happening during COVID. Yep. Um, irrational <laughs> exuberance, right? Um, but that was all over the place during that time in my life. Yeah. It's, um, and I didn't like that feeling. Right. Although I was very good at opening new accounts because I did all those dials and I learned every no possible. And then I began to learn to anticipate no's. And then, you know, once again, it's about, you know, consistency. So, and that's how you decided to make that transition into something that was less just stock driven. You know what's amazing? I didn't decide to do it. Okay. Right? So what happened is I knew I needed change. There was no... I mean, there was no confusion about it. And a gentleman came into my office um, who, by the way, was like the poster child for Guardian for like 25 years. I yeah. just didn't realize that this guy was like the best of the best mm -hmm. when I first met him, right? And he came into my office, somebody I had bought term because I was just getting married. Okay. And he came in and, and sold me a whole life policy, right? And the presentation was so unbelievable and what I was learning about insurance from this gentleman was incredible that I simply said to him, I was like, can, can I work with you? Like, okay. and I had some, I, you know, I had gone from the late nineties making 12,000 a year to 28,000. It's now like 2002, three. And I was, I was, well, it's not a lot of money, but I was making 120 and 150,000. Right. Um, and I kind of had an operation where I was the smartest person in the room. And by the way, <laughs> If you're the smartest person in the room, the room's in trouble. So <laughs> I met this gentleman and um, he uh, he said yes. So I, I got my life license right. and I began to um, have client relationships through accountants and people that were working with us. And I would, I would introduce them to the insurance expert. Okay. And what was amazing was the insurance was able to bring balance, non-correlated or uncorrelated asset right. to the stock market, meaning they don't affect each other. And it was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Like, although um, the stocks, there's no guarantee. And, and for all the folks out there that are pushing life insurance in these videos, let me be clear, we're not pushing it. Right. Inherently in these policies, by state law and by contract, you have to read the fine print, there is guarantees. And, and the dividend isn't, but as far as there is a guarantee rate of return, and that was kind of cool to be able to introduce that as an overall planning tool. Yeah, yeah, and a nice compliment and a way to offset that and you know irrational exuberant and you're very good that for the folks you're very good at explaining that um to where you're able to show folks on because a lot of these a lot of these guys these fiduciaries i'm not judging but they show a lot of pie charts right or they show mountain charts right um but what they really don't show sometimes if not all the time or most of the time i want to watch my words here <laughs> is they don't really get involved in the sequence of returns rate risk the market volatility Absolutely. the age of the market and you're an expert in that yeah, space. Ab absolutely. It's, it's one of these things, Rob, where you, you look at those mountain charts, right? And they all do the same thing. They start in the bottom left corner, go all the way up, yep. right? And it, it has this assumption that your money is always rising. And we know that, you know, market timing has mm. a lot to do with what happens. I haven't met one market timer that's no, ever nobody consistently Nobody can do won. it consistently, yeah. right? And what happens more often than not is it's not about timing the market, but it's time in the market. And when you have these other products that complement and provide guarantees, it allows people to then go and be more keeping their time in the market. Because what I've heard from stories of, of other clients and such is, you know, in 2008, we saw what happened when the bottom fell out, yeah. right? 
a lot of people uh, in that time. There was no calamity bell. No, no one got a warning that next Wednesday <laughs> the bottom was going to fall right. out. But go ahead. And, and and part of the reason I even got into this industry was because of that. I saw so many people yelling on TV about you know <laughs> said they know nothing, right? They know nothing. Remember Jim Cramer talking about that. But, yeah. So one one of the stories that I had heard from a, a client was that in 2008, they sold out their entire portfolio in their 401k and they took it from stock investments wow. into cash. They did it after the crash? Is that what you're saying? After the okay, crash, got right? It. So now you're down 30, 40, 50%, wherever they intra sold year, out. Intra-year, remember, intra-year. Yeah. It, it finished the year down 37, but at one point during the year, check it, don't take our word for it, it right. was down 53%. Yeah, yeah. So they had gotten so scared and the problem with being scared is they literally, when I spoke to them in 2015, 16, had never moved the money out mm. of cash again. And so, you know, to have these compliments and these other guarantees and to be able to put together portfolios that allow people, like you said, integrate and coordinate, yeah. right? All the pieces of their plan and, and really give them a roadmap to to success financially. Yeah. And, and that's amazing. And, and for all the folks out here, just so you know, myself nor Ed are fiduciaries. We are not giving investment advice. We are not economists. We're just simply having a conversation yeah. about the virtues, the values, and the strategies that you always want to make sure your accountant, your fiduciary, your estate attorney, and your insurance agent are on the same page. Absolutely. But your ability to communicate a message, I think, is incredible. Ed. And, and you, we just talked about the mountain chart. Yes. Right? So, you know, <laughs> Eddie talked about the mountain chart, and it looks really big. Every mutual fund, right? It's almost like an iceberg. <laughs> and as we know that below the water, as big as the iceberg is, it's even bigger below. And by the way, what's below is the stuff you can't see. Fees, lost opportunity cost, taxation without representation. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to throw that in there. No, I love that. And so let's let's bring it back, right? So you, you started out as a, as a cold caller. Yep made it to a senior broker yep. and then you got life licensed and started incorporating more pieces into and this was over a nine-year period right just so you know in into the plan and yeah. then you know you you build a team yep you have more people around you let's talk about where epic is today if you don't mind because yep. i want to speak to the pro the entrepreneur out there that has to go through ups and downs yes because I think it's important. Yes. Um, yes, to what Eddie just said, that was built over nine, 10, even an 11 year period. Um, what was interesting is as the business began to grow, and this is, a, this, is, this is for you out there, the power of anticipation is the biggest key to your continuous growth as well as innovation. And in 2009, 10, I stopped doing that. Mm. And in 2011 and 12, my business as I knew it was, was probably 30 or 60 days away from going out of business. Wow. Right? Because I stopped doing what I had been doing that led me to get to that point. Right? Wow. I knew I needed change. I couldn't articulate the change. I had a team around me, great bunch of guys and gals, um, but even to this day, that team did not or would not work in our current environment just because of differences in philosophy and overall planning strategies. Right. So as a result of that pain of 2011, 12 into 13 and 14, a lot of soul searching, a lot of massive shifts began to happen and met new people that were smarter than me, that had um, been there, done that, that yeah. were showing me the way, which took a while, but that eventually led to where 14, 15 and 16 epic yeah, and to where we are now. You know, the and I, I love that you put that in there because I don't think that there's many people that have an interesting story or or attain a level of success without going through something. No, I don't right? know anybody. Uh, you yeah. just don't see it out there. So, you know, to to hear that, you know, you had reached a level of success and then saw it almost collapse and yep. then to bring it back to where you are today is, yeah. is, is incredible. Let's talk about where you see Epic moving in the future now. You know, I think that uh, the message of Epic, Empower, Protect, Integrate, Coordinate, um, we want to provide world-class education for the consumer. We want to be able to provide economic redemption and a place for uh, the advisor and or agent specifically that had gotten lost over the years, as well as um, being able to create a culture, what we like to call the coalition of the willing, Yeah. right? Everywhere in our industry, there's two things that don't happen, but they do happen here. Number one, 
The industry typically recruits the college kid who um, has influence or his parents has influence. Yeah. And um, they they have an archaic model of sales training that probably goes back to the 50s or 60s. And listen, if you're triggered, it's not meant to, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings right now. So I don't want anyone to get triggered on what I'm saying. But the truth is, the reason why 90 to 95% fail in this business is because it's not proper training. That's yes. it. So I think the question we began to ask ourselves here at Epic right. is, hey, how can we provide um, a place where people want to come and listen to financial education with an open mind and a peak state and match them up with with licensed folks that can share that message. Yes. I think that's been the difference. And I think that's why we've had such massive acceleration. Where do I see it five or 10 years? I guess rinse and repeat that model, continuously uh, innovate, continuously market, contribute to all the different foundations that, that are dear to our hearts. And for me, um, when, I, when I look at money, I don't look at money as um, a trophy. Um, there may have been a time in my life when that was the case. Uh, to, to me, we view money as stealth soldiers mm -hmm. that can advance the business, um, advance the education, and really allow people to um, not only grow as part of Epic, but also be able to, to help all the people out there that aren't getting helped because they just don't have enough money. The truth is, if you deal with these financial institutions, you might hear it, I only work with a client that has X amount. Well, we don't do that here. Right. We're here, we want to work with people that are financial, that are seeking financial education, family-oriented, proper planning, and that come in a peak state looking to listen. Yes, yeah. It's, it's about having an open mind and understanding that there's more out there than what you're being marketed to, right? These financial institutions, they write the rules. Well said. The, the governments write the rules. And so all of these different aspects, you know, it's about you taking control of your finances and taking control of your money. And the first way to do that is through education. Yes. And, and really, great point. Thank you for sharing that, Ed. It's, it's understanding what, what is your investment or economic philosophy. And you may not know that. And that's why it's important. Go ahead and click the link below. One of the team members here at Epic will take you through that process. Yeah. No obligation. But it's really important to discover who you are. What drives you about money, either from a scarce right? Yeah. Or an abundant mindset. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, if you click that link below, one of the members will take you through that success journey and educational process. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much for sharing everything here today. I think, uh, I think it was very good for everybody to really get an understanding of who we are here at Epic. Yes. So thank thank you, you, brother.